There was a time before automobiles and shopping malls and cell phones when you had to work pretty hard to get the things you needed just to live a reasonable life. In fact, most of life's essentials, like the clothing on your back, the food on your table, even the house in which you lived, were the product of muscle, human as well as animal, and individual skill. Because you had to grow or make the things you needed, it took a lot longer to get them. Want fast food? Forget it. No drive-in chicken joints here. A new house, a bigger barn? Start with the trees at the edge of the forest. But about 200 years ago, all that began to change with the help of mills. These early factories turned out machine-made products that could be bought in stores, and they offered a new way of working that changed the way people lived. Societies that once responded to the rhythm of the sun and seasons now move to the beating of the clock. This industrial revolution would bring giant factories and working classes entrepreneurs and inventors, and an era we call mill times. Major funding for Mill Times has been provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities for 30 years expanding our understanding of the world and by the National Science Foundation, America's investment in the future. Funding is also provided by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. So what did people do 200 years ago if they needed a necessity of life like clothing? Say you need a new pair of pants or a shirt. There's no mall nearby. So you have to make them. And the first thing you must do is gather the raw material. Now in some regions you turn to cotton or flax. But here at New England's old Sturbridge village you turn to sheep for their wool. Of course, it wasn't that easy. Sheep shearing was a laborious process for the shearer and the sheep. And then you had to have someone with enough skill to turn all this raw wool into cloth. After cleaning the wool, it had to be carded. This took strong fingers and prickly brushes, like pet brushes, to untangle and separate the fibers. And to create wispy tubes of wool called slivers. You then stretch the slivers into yarn on a spinning wheel. Notice how the yarn gets twisted as it winds onto the spindle? This makes it strong enough to weave without breaking. You turn yarn into fabric on a loom, and this is a typical hand loom. Now, weaving was done by both men and women, so I should probably do okay at this. First of all, we have to set up the loom by drawing threads from the warp beam behind the loom across the top to another beam near my feet. The warp threads pass through harnesses, which I can raise or lower by pressing down on these foot pedals. And when I do that, it creates a space between alternating sets of warp threads. I'm going to take the shuttle, which is this wooden contraption with a spool of yarn in it called a bobbin, and I'm going to push it across through that space 
perpendicular to the warp threads. I then press it down, change pedals to raise the other harness to create that over and under pattern that you get used to seeing in weaving. I send the shuttle back through, pull it snug, tamp it down, and repeat this process over and over again until there's something else I'm supposed to do or my arms fall off. You can see just how much time is going to go into this to produce enough fabric to make clothes. I mean, there's the carding and the spinning and the weaving. Then there's the cutting and the stitching and so on, which sort of explains why people back then would have had relatively few clothes. But by the middle of the 1700s, help was on the way. And it began with water-powered machines. For centuries, people had used the turning force of water wheels to help with tough jobs, like driving blades for sawing wood. And rotating coarse stones for grinding grain into flour. But eventually, water wheels began to power more complicated devices that would revolutionize cloth making, like this carding machine. What an improvement over the pet brushes. And by rolling out wispy slivers all day long, it was a great labor-saving device. But this was even better. I'm standing next to a machine called a water frame. It was created by the famous English inventor Richard Arkwright, this model's from the 1780s, to spin cotton into yarn. Though it looks fairly complex, it really isn't. It runs on water power, just like the carding machine and saw blades we saw earlier. The cotton in the top spools is drawn out by the action of the machine, which twists it nice and tight, and then gathers the yarn onto these bottom spools. It works just like a hand spinning wheel. 96 of them, actually. So it's little wonder that spinning by machine would eventually make spinning by hand obsolete. In no time, spinning mills began springing up all over England. By the late 1700s, these mills were putting whole villages to work, making yarn inside the new factories or weaving it into cloth in their homes. The spinning industry was so successful, it quickly spread to the rest of Europe. And it was only a matter of time before it reached England's former colonies in America as well. Radrak Moore is my name, and you? Uh, uh, pray, I'm Huntington. I'm going to America to start my own mill, a thread-making mill. You? Oh, my brother is already in America. A mechanic, like myself. I hope to go into business with him. Could such an English spinning mill be built in this rough land? Uh, there aren't many who would have the skill. But if anyone could do it... It'd be me. Now, I need only find some person of means to invest in my vision. Well, Shadrach, we've still got many more appointments today. Please God, one will show some interest. You'll never make
make money out of that in America, Mr. Huntington. Good day to you. Well, I suppose I'd best be writing my brother about that job after all. <clears throat> well, they say America is a land of opportunity for a man with a vision, and I'm sure I am that man. And this breast wheel design, Mr. Gresham, is ideally suited to the rivers hereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this spot on the Blackstone River would be perfect. Perhaps. Uh, I know little of these thread-making mills. I am certain a mill such as this will be profitable in no time. I like a man with vision. <laughs> Evidently, so does my daughter Elizabeth. It seems that you've gained both our interests. You will dine with us tonight? I would be honored, sir. Shadrach! Shadrach! Good news! Very good news! We have an investor! Mm -hmm. I hope you'll not be disappointed. Oh, I'm certain we'll succeed! call upon my son-in-law, whose vision inspired me in this noble enterprise to inaugurate Huntington Mill. Friends and neighbours, on this day our community is entering a new era, such as has never been seen before in this land. Huntington Mill will bring new jobs, new opportunity and new prosperity for all. Father, Priam has accomplished a great deal with your support. The local people are quite taken with the new mill. Even Mary Methuen, who was one of the best hand spinners in the area, has come. She now runs the boarding house for the men who work in the mill. Each spinning frame produces as much yarn in a day as 50 hand spinners. Priam is already taking orders from Boston. All in the community are doing better because of our mill. Before they dammed the river for the mill, we had all the fish we needed. Now the salmon are blocked from swimming upstream to spawn. I say we just chop up the dam and be done with it. One year ago today, we opened our doors, Shadrach. And you've yet to turn a profit. Ah, but we're close. And we're still building our business. Our time will come. Did you see this? What's this embargo all about? No British goods to be sold here. And this embargo was your idea, I suppose. No, but with people not able to buy English yarn, now they'll have to buy ours. Another drink? Perhaps a wee dram, just to warm the innards. <laughs>
all mills need a steady supply of running water. And here in New England, there's plenty of rain and melting snow to feed powerful rivers that once drove the big wheels of the new textile mills. But any river's flow can be unpredictable. Sometimes there's too much water, sometimes not enough. So to control the power of the river, mill owners built dams. Now this old dam on the Branch River in Rhode Island is a typical mill dam. It doesn't completely block the river, but it raises the height of the water to create an elevated mill pond. Now, if we dig a channel called a head race from the pond to the mill, that pent up water behind the dam will flow through the head race, turn the wheel, and then rejoin the river through the tail race. So dams and their ponds acted like storage tanks for the H2O fuel the water wheel engines ran on. You can still find scores of mill dams all along New England's rivers. But this one in Pawtucket, Rhode Island is special because it powered America's very first spinning mill. Legend has it that in 1789, a young entrepreneur named Samuel Slater defied the laws of England by supervising the construction of English-style cotton spinning machinery at the mill in Pawtucket. England had tried to protect its fledgling monopoly on spinning machines with patents. But Slater, who worked in the mills, understood how to make similar machines and came to America to seek his fortune. Other Rhode Island mills quickly followed Slater's successful venture, including the picturesque Wilkinson Mill right next door, which houses a beautifully restored water wheel and gives us a pretty good idea of how a powertrain actually works. At the Wilkinson Mill, water from the head race flows into a wheelhouse where it steadily turns the big water wheel. The wheel is connected to revolving metal gears. And as the gears turn in rhythm with the wheel, they rotate a vertical pole called the main shaft. The main shaft rises through the ceiling and extends all the way to the top of the building. On each floor, the vertical shaft turns horizontal shafts that hang just below the ceiling. A leather belt carries the power from those horizontal shafts to a pair of pulleys above each machine. Now, to get the power to the machine itself, I'm going to turn the machine on by sliding the belt from one pulley to another. And voila, the machine works. Now, this is not a spinning machine, it's a lathe. A lot of mills, like Wilkinson, had their own machine shops. This is a wood lathe. It was actually used to produce those humble workhorses of the spinning industry, the bobbin. Yarn from the spinning machines was spooled onto bobbins. And in the beginning, that's all the textile mills produced, yarn. But by the 1820s, inventors had finally figured out how to make machines that could take all those spools of yarn and weave them into cloth. This power loom is weaving a plain piece of fabric. All the things I had to do on the hand loom are now being performed by this machine, only a whole lot faster. In fact, the wooden shuttle I threw by hand whips its thread back and forth so quickly, we have to slow down the action for you to see it. These looms could be very dangerous. If a shuttle like this should break free, it could pierce your flesh like a bullet. If you got your sleeve caught, it could cost you an arm. But when the power loom was perfected, weaving, like yarn spinning before it, would move from the home to the mill.
many newer mills became huge as owners sought greater profits by bringing carding, spinning, and weaving all under the same roof. As more and more mills sprang up, there was increased competition and the occasional dispute over issues like backwater. Backwater would occur when one mill's dam impeded the natural flow of the river to the point where water wheels in upstream mills couldn't turn properly. Because water was so valuable as fuel, clashes over water rights were common. But with the demand for machine-made textiles soaring, it looked like everyone's profits would just keep flowing. Determined, just like his father. What's that? Oh. Oh. Water wheel shaft has just cracked. Ice. Oh. Machines don't last forever, you know. And we've all these new orders to fill. going again, will we still have customers? And what will these repairs cost, dare I ask? Well, it shouldn't be cheap, I dare say. I know it looks grave, but this actually could be good for us. Really? This optimism could be the death of us. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Why don't we regard this as an opportunity to increase the size and capacity of the mill? We could improve the dam and install a bigger wheel to run even more machines. Had I but thought of that, I'd have sawed the shaft in half myself before now. Josiah, I believe we'd make back the investment many times over. You're talking about rebuilding the entire mill, investing in new machines. It will take years to recover our funds. Spinning is merely the beginning. There are looms now that will actually weave cloth. We can be the first in the area to have them. There's no end to progress if we only prepare ourselves to meet it. The mill established by my father and grandfather is much larger now. For some time, I have helped in running the business. Shadrach has now brought in his nephew, Zachary, to help him with the machinery. The new mechanical looms can be temperamental. I hope it holds together. As is Shadrach when they don't function as they should. Zach is doing a fine job in the mill. So is Mary Methuen's young niece, Sarah. I do believe Zach has taken a fancy to her. She came last year after her parents died. She started as a bobbin girl and progressed quickly into one of our best weavers. She even finds time to help Mary at the boarding house. In fact, everything in our little community has been going splendidly. But now... I are up against it now, laddies. Oh, Shadrach, you are always gloomy. Ah, but today there's a real reason for gloom. And so I give you Northgate Mill! <laughs> Yes, Shadrach. We're not alone anymore. Ah, the new mill's dam has created backwater. 
The wheel cannot turn freely, and none of our machines can operate properly. It's intolerable. And they've twice the workers we have. They've no right. People have a right to work, Daniel. And a right to steal away our business? And what might I do for you, esteemed gentlemen? We'd like to speak with the owners. Regrettably, they live uh, out of town. Who are they? They'll prefer to remain discreet. Prudent business, you know. Last week, your dam backed up the water and made it impossible to turn our wheel at speed. You're depriving us of our just water rights. A matter of opinion, I'm sure. A matter of fact. With respect, sir, what is a matter of fact, if memory serves, is that you dammed the river long before my employers did so. Well, that was a, a different situation. But germane, I should think. Good day to you, gentlemen. We shall achieve our desired outcome through the courts. But if they don't do anything, we could be ruined. You've worked too hard for that, Father. It should be remembered that when you built your mill, some of the farmers complained about your dam and what it was doing to their fishing. But, but our mill brought jobs to this community. And Northgate Mill brings even more. You will pay full restitution to the Northgate owners to rebuild their dam. But wait a moment! This isn't fair! After all the work we've done and... You two have done enough damage as it is. And I expect both parties to meet and work out an arrangement to use the river for everyone's benefit. I expect to see a report to that effect in 30 days. Court is adjourned. Mr. Zachary Moore. Yes, sir? I've heard you're mechanically minded and get the most out of your workers. Those are valuable skills, young man. Valuable skills indeed, in an industry such as ours. This huge room would have been fairly typical of weaving floors in the big textile mills of the 19th century. As mills grew larger, some of them changed, from businesses that could be managed by one or two people and a small workforce, to a factory system with hundreds of workers and scores of managers, overseers, and accountants. The biggest problem for the biggest mills, like Boot Mill here in Lowell, Massachusetts, was finding enough workers to run the machinery. In the early 19th century, nine out of 10 Americans still lived on farms and had no experience with millwork. Without enough skilled hands to run the complex machinery, the big mills of Lowell, Massachusetts would have remained a dream. It was American textile entrepreneur Francis Cabot Lowell who had the vision in the first place. He had witnessed the terrible conditions faced by mill workers in England and decided he could create a wholesome atmosphere that would attract country women to work in his mills. When he offered decent wages too, the daughters of cash-strapped farmers flocked to this unique city of mills and became famous as the Lowell Girls. When they arrived, the women found that Lowell was serious about the wholesome atmosphere. 
there were rules and curfews that everyone had to follow, even when they weren't working. Drinking alcohol was strictly prohibited, for example. And to further protect their reputations and souls, employers required all women to attend Sunday church service. All other times, bells called the women to work. Their day would last 12 to 13 hours or more. And when they weren't working, they spent most of their time inside one of the hundreds of boarding houses scattered throughout the city. The women of Lowell were very well fed by their employers. One wrote, we had cod soup, baked cod, and fish hash. We have pie two or three times a day, coffee, and warm biscuits. All the workers got three decent meals a day, clean linens, and a room to sleep in, and all for about a dollar and a quarter a week. Now that may sound like a bargain, but it only left them two or three dollars a week after working for 70 hours or more. Now that's about the same as a few hundred dollars in today's money. Not great for all that work, but still a lot better than working on the farm where they probably would have gotten nothing. Excuse me, is there any more of that fish hash? The young women lived in cramped rooms with two or three beds to a room. Sharing beds wasn't too bad, considering they often slept in worse conditions back home. They loved to write letters and keep journals. Complaints about rodents, the communal outhouse, and a lack of privacy were common. But most women clearly liked the boarding house life and the excitement of the city, especially on Sundays, their one day off. After church, they would spend their time courting, socializing, or promenading in the fresh air. They might attend a play, a lecture, or a concert until this brief respite was over. And then it was back to the mills for another week of heavy toil. The work at Lowell was fast-paced and strenuous. The noise of the machinery made some workers deaf. And the dust-filled air was unhealthy to breathe. Most women saved their money and left after a few years. Some returned home. Others struck out to make their own destiny. But while they were here, they became highly skilled workers capable of performing the intricate tasks that made these mills successful. I'm so pleased you've elected to join us here at Northgate. You will be an overseer with many responsibilities and opportunities. Just sign here, Mr. Moore. It was a difficult decision moving over to Northgate Mill. With Uncle Shadrach and old Mr. Huntington passed on to their rewards, and Daniel unwilling to take on the cost of expanding, I feel I have no choice. You'll be very happy here, I'm sure. I know Daniel thinks I deserted him, but this mill represents the future far more than his. Someday, perhaps, I could even own my own mill. That would be splendid, Mr. Moore. Please, call me Zachary, or even just Zach, if you prefer. What about you, Miss Methuen, Sarah, and of what do you dream? I've never found dreaming a particularly productive activity. Go on, tell him, Sarah. Well, if you must know, I'd love to own a small shop someday. Perhaps sell hats. Oh, I shouldn't have told you. Come over to Northgate, Sarah. I've told them about you. They pay good cash wages. You can begin saving for your shop. I'd be old before I'd saved enough. Some of the weavers put away as much as $50 a year. But they must work so much harder and faster, I hear tell. Ah, oh, most are country girls who don't know the ways of industry. With your experience, you'd be fine. A top earner in no time. 
I'll consider your offer, Mr. Moore. I hope you will. Did you hear that? Cash wages! And I'll bet I could operate a loom, just like you. And you could get to know Mr. Moore even better. Stop! These opportunities don't come along every day. I'm sorry, Mary, but I won't make an exception. If Sarah no longer works in my mill, she no longer lives in my boarding house. Now, Sarah, you don't have to worry about me. Northgate's a good opportunity. And it's not like you're moving far away. There are nice families you can live with there, and we still see each other on Sundays. But Aunt Mary... No buts. You have to make your own place in this world, just as I came from the farm to the mill when I was about your age. The market is glutted and prices continue to fall. We are being forced to sell our cloth for less. Therefore, we must find ways to be more productive and uh, lower costs. Well, everyone is working diligently. Perhaps costs could be cut by having each girl tend three machines instead of two. That may be hard on some of the girls. Well, since each weaver will be producing more cloth, at least they can make more money on their piece rate. I've already considered that point. Since each weaver will be producing more cloth, we can lower the piece rate, and they can still earn the same as before, if they can keep up. a friend to us workers. He's not my beau. I hear they're rewarding him for getting more work out of us. I'm sure that isn't true. He isn't like the rest of them. He is them. Then we'll have to fight for ourselves. And don't forget to tell them about what nearly happened when your bobbin girl's apron got caught. She could have been killed, Sarah. It's just not safe. We, the undersigned, considering ourselves wronged and our privileges invaded by our unjust and unreasonable lowering of our wages, do hereby mutually and cheerfully engage not to enter the factory after Monday, Monday next, next for the, the purpose of work until such time as our grievances are addressed. Intolerable! Someone must have put them up to this. You are known to have your eye on Sarah McEwen. It must have been you. It was not. But they do make a case for themselves. We speeded up the machines and lowered the wages. Surely you would grumble too. What shall we do then, Zachary? You tell me. Cut profits to our investors? If we do that, they will close the mill entirely. Better lower wages than none at all. These are tough times. been any of us. I'm leaving. I'll find work somewhere else. Me too. No, none of us should have to leave. And if one or two of us do, they can easily replace us. But not if we all stand together. This is Moses Brown, the Rhode Island businessman who enticed Samuel Slater to Pawtucket and then helped finance Slater's pioneering cotton mill. Moses was a chance taker who was fascinated by inventions like his prized electrostatic generator and by visionary enterprises like spinning mills. I'm standing in the beautifully restored home of Moses' brother, John Brown, who was a fighting patriot, a friend of George Washington's, and a very successful financier. 
John owned a world-renowned shipping company and was a prominent investor in the manufacture of rum, the smelting of iron, and the trading of slaves. His businesses made him extremely rich, so he built this impressive home in Providence and filled it with famous guests and fine furnishings. Though they were both successful businessmen, the Brown brothers did not necessarily see eye to eye. John was unabashed in his support of the slave trade, and Moses, a converted and devout Quaker, was so opposed to slavery, he fought hard to abolish it. But like his brother, Moses Brown remained an entrepreneur, and when he chanced upon textile manufacturing, he could hardly have imagined he was helping to transform New England. Now Moses was basically an investor in the industry. Other textile pioneers built their mills from the ground up and spent their lives trying to make them successful. This bucolic looking place is Harrisville, New Hampshire. Harrisville began as a single woolen mill and like similar enterprises, grew in size and importance after the American embargo of British textiles in 1809. The mill was started by Bethuel Harris and his sons, Cyrus and Milan. With a few thousand dollars and a dozen workers, they began a woolen operation that would last 150 years. The Harrises lived in those houses over there, not a stone's throw from their mill. Over time, they built more mills, boarding houses for single workers, and individual homes for families. Mylan Harris even built this schoolhouse for the workers' children, which, unfortunately, was very cold in the winter. Rather than repair the drafty schoolhouse, he stuffed wool, which he had plenty of, into the cracks in the floors. The result was that the teachers and kids nearly froze, and Mylan was chastised by state authorities for running one of the worst schools in New Hampshire. But the Harrises were not mean or greedy and treated their workers fairly when they could afford to. For unlike rich owners, the Harrises were completely dependent on the fortunes of their mill. They personally fixed machinery, fought icy wheels, hired and fired workers, sweated over accounts, and hustled for business. If prices fell or labor costs rose or natural disasters struck, their enterprise could fail instantly. And without the deep pockets of rich mill owners, the Harrises were never far from financial ruin. But with equal parts luck and hard work, the Harrises made it, becoming country comfortable rather than brown family rich. And for mill owners like the Harrises, that was enough. Now, not all New England textile mills succeeded. But the big cotton mills generally did very well because the American South was an excellent source of cheap slave-grown cotton and an even better market for machine-made cloth. Abolitionist Senator Charles Sumner railed against the conspiracy between the Lords of the Lash in the South and the Lords of the Loom in the North. Thinking that Sumner had equated them with slaves, Lowell's workers passionately declared themselves the daughters of free men. But mill workers could be treated very unfairly, especially when demand fell and prices dropped. Owners could cut wages, increase hours, or speed up production, all in an effort to maintain profits. On rare occasions, workers fought back by turning out or going on strike. But then, as now, such tactics could be very risky for both sides. They actually walked out? These girls must be taught a lesson. We cannot have them dictating terms. Next, they'll want Saturdays off. Who was their leader? I believe a young woman by the name of Sarah Methuen. Well, get rid of her. By your leave, gentlemen. Perhaps a subtler plan might be effective. 
With the upturn in the market, the Northgate mill owners have authorised the following. They will shorten the workday by one half hour and are prepared to pay an extra penny on piece rate. Well, at least they've done something. I know how unfairly you've been treated, but I hope you feel this is a step in the right direction. If the workers wish to consider this a victory, that is a fortuitous turn of affairs. A happy worker is a productive worker. But now, Raymond, I think it would be prudent to deliver a timely message. Begin training the new girls from the carding room to work the looms. <laughs> They're not nearly as experienced. But more desperate for employment, I should think. And they can be taught to work the looms far easier than the others can be taught not to be troublesome. We must regard our workers as part of a machine. If one part abrades, the rest can be damaged. What is that, Sarah? I've been sacked. You are to leave the premises immediately. Gather your belongings from the boarding house and be gone by tomorrow morning. Here's the money owed you. Sarah, I heard what happened. I'm sure you did. It's not the way you think. Where will you go? My aunt is frail. She needs help with the boarding house. Mr. Daniel has kindly permitted me to return. Daniel's mill has no future and neither does the boarding house. You can't be thinking of... I can be thinking anything I please in this free country, Mr. Moore. It is the one thing I do that cannot be regulated. Sarah? You must believe I knew nothing about this. And why should I believe you this time after all? Because when I found out, I quit. I've saved some money and I want to go west. I hear there's a great opportunity out there for a man who's not afraid to be industrious. <laughs> Lord knows you're not that, Zachary Moore. Good luck to you. It could be a hard life at first until I get my feet planted, but it could be a great adventure. And it's an adventure I dearly like to share. I'm sorry. My aunt needs me. I won't give up on you, Sarah. I promise you that. Sarah! This came for you, Sarah. All the way from California. My dear Sarah, perhaps you've heard about the gold strikes in the new state of California. My mechanical skills have paid off handsomely in the design of mining machinery. I'm in San Francisco now, where I definitely detect the need for a fine hat shop. I'd dearly love to invest and be your partner in that enterprise and make you my partner in all other things as well. I know I'm not very good at putting things into words, Sarah, but if you could see a future in California as my wife, you would make me the happiest man in this fortunate land of ours. Benchley has been on the brink of another disaster. The first night I lit candles, he sent for his children to come home, which they did. Afterwards, he and I had a considerable of a warm debate. Now, the letter was the telephone of its day, the primary means of communication over distance. And this letter from Samuel Slater shows his annoyance with a parent named Benchley, who kept his children from working in the mill even after Slater had lit extra candles so they could see in the dark. Yes, children worked hard at Slater and at other mills throughout New England. They also worked on farms and in craft shops, just about everywhere. Few children had the luxury of going to school full-time. 
and working in the mills at least meant a decent place to eat and sleep. Slater appreciated his younger workers. What he complained about were their overly protective parents and the fickle adult workers who were constantly leaving him to work in other mills. He was also unhappy about his personal fortune. Though he ran a successful mill that bore his name, he was not the majority owner and felt he could do better with his own venture. So in 1806, he built a new mill complex and proudly named it Slatersville. Over the decades, the surrounding community grew along with the mill. And by mid-century, the Slater family had built two additional mills and installed steam engines to help power the machinery. Quarry Bank Mill in England houses an early working model. This remarkable contraption is an old steam engine. Look at the precise movement of the vertical piston. It's moved up and down by the rise and fall of steam pressure inside the cylinder. And that up and down motion is converted into rotary motion, which operates all the machines. This was a revolutionary device. It made it possible to run machines any time, any place, and in any kind of weather. Over the years, operators used both steam power and water power. But eventually, the steam engine replaced water wheels as the primary source of power for most mills. With steam engines to run machinery, mills no longer had to be located near rivers. And once freed from the river, the stage was set for the demise of the New England mill. By the middle of the 20th century, many New England textile companies had moved south. Where labor was cheap, where cotton grew right outside the door, and where swift-moving rivers no longer mattered. In more recent decades, the industry has moved to even cheaper labor markets in Asia and the Pacific. Today, the largest textile centers in the world lie far beyond the United States and Great Britain. Leaving places like Slatersville abandoned and desolate. In England and New England, the textile industry is only a shadow of the enterprise it once was. And many old mills are now rotting from neglect. Or completely gone. A few communities have restored mill buildings, turning them into apartments, shopping malls, even art studios. But here in New England, the industry that supported generation after generation of working families is, for the most part, over. At their height, mills were criticized for bringing a decline in craftsmanship and a machine-like regimentation to the workplace. But they created enormous benefits as well, as anchors for cities, as innovators of new technologies. They put vast numbers of people to work and brought affordable products to consumers everywhere. For better or worse, mills have shaped our world and the way we live as surely as any force in history.
Major funding for Mill Times has been provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities for 30 years expanding our understanding of the world and by the National Science Foundation, America's investment in the future. Funding is also provided by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.